Good morning, everyone. Uh, me coming up to speak is strategic because I now have to sort out the theology of Christmas for you, just in case you've been deceived. Wasn't that great with the kids? Beautiful. And uh, it's a joy to uh, share with you a couple of passages from the Bible that help us really centre ourselves and help us to appreciate who Jesus is and uh, why he came to earth, what he did for us and what he's doing right now and what he wants to do for each of us in this place and for every person uh, throughout the world. There's a great Bible verse that uh, um, 700 years before Jesus came on the scene, before God sent him to this earth, the prophet Isaiah predicted him and actually described his nature and his mission and his purpose. It's an amazing passage of scripture. So when we look at Isaiah's prophecy about Jesus, we see that he's revealing the God of hope. And some of you this Christmas are going to be surprised by the hope that there is through the person of Jesus. Look at this Bible verse in Isaiah 9, 6 to 8. It's in the message, which is a wonderful uh, uh, paraphrase. For a child has been born for who? For us, for you, for me. Amazing, so the gift of a son for us. He personalizes it. and says there's going to be a baby born for you. It's going to be a gift of a son for you as well. His names will be Amazing Counselor, Strong God, Eternal Father, Prince of Wholeness. Another translation says Prince of Peace. And look at this final phrase. His ruling authority will grow and there'll be no limits to the wholeness he brings or to the peace that he brings. Our world, this world that we're living in is starving for real and lasting hope. And the Christmas story gives us the answer as to the source of this hope. And it's a person. His name is Jesus who is still alive and he's so ready to minister and to help us today in our day of need. So these four statements of, of Isaiah, I've worded them this way, amazing counsellor speaks to me of Jesus being the loving wisdom of God. In John chapter 1 verse 14, I want to read a verse with each of these comments. So the word became human, became one of us, and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love or full of grace and truth, faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, John writes, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. And so the writers of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, they're saying people saw him. People walked with him. People talked with him. They ate with him. They drank with him. They heard him. They allowed him to to minister to them, to help them. Uh, I was watching a documentary just uh, the other, I think it was yesterday, on the Roman Empire, and it just quoted Tacitus, who was a pagan. He was a, uh, he he wasn't very pro-Christian. But he records about the story. This is not from the Bible. This is from the famous Roman historian named Tacitus, who wrote all about the Roman emperors. And he wasn't a believer, but he said, you know, there was a guy called Jesus. And he claimed to be God or, you know, he was a heretic and he tried to displace Caesar. So we killed him. We executed him. And uh, now there's a bunch of rabble rousers going around the place. So he's very negative about about Christians, the new Christians. This is like uh, 60 uh, AD or so. So 30 years after the events that Tacitus is writing. But what I'm saying is there's no question that Jesus was a real person. He was a real person, a person of history. People saw him, people talked with him, and they recorded. And there's not one piece of literature that says, oh, no, it's, it's just not true. It's actually true. Kids, it's true. It really happened. Jesus came to earth. And, uh, and, and Isaiah says, he's going to be our amazing counsellor. He is the loving wisdom of God. 
I've known Jesus now for, uh, or next year, or the, uh, actually nearly 50 years. So I was very young, 17 years old when I became a, a Christian. And uh, I've known him now for, for nearly half a century. And he's more real to me today than anything else in this world. Yet I can't see him. Yet I can't say so here he is physically. But spiritually, my eyes have been opened. My ears have been unplugged. My heart's been touched. And he has come into my life. And he can come into your life, kids. He can come and live there. And big kids... He is alive. He is real. He is our counsellor. And I can tell you, he has never done me any wrong in the 50 years almost that I've known him. And I've experienced his presence and his love and his grace and his truth and his faithfulness. And he is so wise and he is so loving. Whatever you're going through, and some of you may be going through a difficult time this Christmas. Christmas can be a time where, where old traumas are reawakened in people. And uh, Christmas can be a time of, of terrible stress. And uh, some people who've lost loved ones during the year, Christmas is really tough. It's really hard. I remember the first Christmas when uh, my mum had died just uh, uh, a couple of months earlier and we were about to, to give thanks. And I just found myself crying, you know, like, oh, just weeping. And we all started crying. And um, because... Christmas is a time where we come together to share and, and, and to give gifts and to remember the greatest gift of all, the gift of Jesus. We remember the gift of our parents. We remember the gift of, of life. And we remember who the author of life is. And Jesus always has a word of wisdom, a word that's loving, a word that's truthful. When you read the four Gospels, and if you're not a reader of the four Gospels, please do it. I grab my iPhone. I love iPhones, don't you? The technology, you stick it in your pocket and you go for a walk down the River Torrens and you can have half a gospel spoken to you with an American accent or, or, or an Oxford accent. I want an Aussie accent, thanks. Dave Bland, that's a job for you. And, uh, but as I'm walking, I want to sit down on, on a bench and just say, Lord, I just can't believe that there are people that don't believe. That if they really hear what you have to say, if they really grasp how you talked with that person, how you acted and interacted, they would bow their knee and say, Jesus, you're alive. Nobody could make up this story. It's impossible. Only God himself. He has wisdom for you. He has a wise word for you. But you've got to look for it. And so you've got to read what he said and, and, and what he did. And as you do that, and for me as a 17-year-old, as I started reading my little Gideon's, my little red Gideon's Bible. Some of you may remember those. And they gave it to us in uh, year seven or year eight in school. And I just stuck it on a shelf or somewhere and I just collected dust uh, for several years. And I just thought, what? Gideon's Bible? What is that? Oh, that's a bit like what my mum tells me about mythology. Like mum would tell me, being Greek, all about the Greek gods, you know, Zeus and, and uh, Mars and... And then also the, the great stories of Homer. And, and I just thought, oh, it's a bunch of myths. It's just made up stories to help people. So I never took the New Testament seriously. But then when someone shared with me that they had experienced Jesus in their life, I thought, oh, I'll just, oh, fine. I dusted it off and I started reading. I could not believe it when I started reading. I thought, what? Why hasn't someone told me this? The words were loving. The words were wise. The words were healing. And I felt his presence as I'm reading because I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. This is amazing. And I found that there were words that were relevant for me as a 17-year-old. You can experience his loving wisdom. He is an amazing counsellor. He is the best counsellor in all the world. And he has the right word for you. And maybe this Christmas season, you need a special touch from him, a special message, a special word. Uh, don't go to bed tonight without grabbing perhaps the Gospel of John and just reading a couple of chapters. Or get on your iPhone and hook in and, and listen to it. Secondly, he is a strong God. Amazing counsellor, loving, wise. He is a strong God. Here I see Jesus is the limitless power of God. 
He is God. He made the heavens and the earth. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in heaven. Made everything. And the Father said to the Son and spoke to him and says, listen, there's a problem, as we know. Human beings who were made in my image and were made perfect, they decided to turn their back on us and go their own way. And that's where sin came into the world. And sin, I, 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 I define sin as S, a big I, and N. And that I is independence. So what is sin? It's just choosing to live independently of God, who is loving and wise and who made us for himself. And with him at the centre of our life, we live the right life. We live the fullness of life. And, and there's no pain and suffering and evil and death and sickness but as soon as human beings turned their back, all these negative things happened. And so the history of the world is one where people have been living independently of God and there's been that separation has caused people just to rely upon their own wisdom. And relying on their own wisdom and trying to find love in relationships hasn't worked. So there's trouble between people. Marriages break up. Society gets fragmented. Wars occur. And history tells us that there's something wrong with, with the human condition, something wrong with us. And we say that what's wrong with us is that we're not being dependent on him because there's a, there's a God-shaped void. He made us for himself and we're wired for Jesus. And only Jesus can, can fill that gap that's within us. And so there he has limitless power to change the orientation of a person's life. Nobody can forgive you your sins. Nobody can erase your guilty conscience. Nobody can, can really change the levels of anxiety or depression or life issues. We can define them. We can actually manage them. But to change them radically requires the power of God through Jesus Christ. And he can do that. He can radically change you. Look at what Jesus said about himself here. In Matthew 19, Jesus looked at them and, and intently and said, humanly speaking, it's impossible. But with God, everything is possible. There are no limitations with God. God is so good and God is so powerful. And he reveals his power to us in so many ways. In fact, the Bible says that every good and perfect gift that we enjoy in this life comes from him. Now, when I was 12, who's 12? Any of the kids here are 12? Only 12 year olds? Okay. When I was 12, I nearly died. I came down with pneumonia, which is an infection, a terrible bacteria in both my lungs. And so I was delirious and uh, I was sort of semi-conscious and they, they called the doctor and I still remember Dr. Fotheringham, his name. Quick, Maria, he says to, to my mum, Maria, stomata, straight to the hospital. So I go straight to the hospital. And I can never forget it because I was there for about two weeks and they used to give you injections. Now, kids, this is not an exaggeration. The injections were this big. <laughs> and every morning and every night, I had to roll over and they would stick it right here in my backside. Why? Because there's lots of fat tissue there. And I still remember the nurse coming with this great big injection. And it was like a spear. And it was like, <laughs> boom, oh! So I used to hide in the toilets. And the girls would laugh and they'd say, oh, little Billy's in there hiding. We'll get him. Well, it doesn't matter if it's half an hour late. So I'd sneak back to bed and they'd come, hey, Billy, which side? Go, oh, no, they got me. And I had to feel which side hurt the most. Uh, that was the morning and evening. So they stuck this stuff called penicillin in me. Do you know, just 30 years earlier, when people got infections, most of them died. Most of them died. And, and so... God gave us this amazing idea. Came through a man called Fleming, and he, and he saw something in mould, in mouldy stuff. And then there was a guy from Adelaide named Flory, Howard Flory, and he, in England, developed penicillin and antibiotics. How many of you have had an infection and you've had to have antibiotics and penicillin? Can I see your hands raised? Yeah, look at that. Half of you would have been dead if you didn't have this thing. God is the one who gives good gifts. And I believe that, that, that the goodness of God shows itself in the creativity 
and the innovation, the ideas to try and, and do good within our world. God loves us so much that he, he tries to push back the, independ- the consequences of the independence of sin, self-centeredness, sickness, disease, all those, all those kinds of things. And, and so God is so good. He has limitless power and he tries to help us. And we're human beings. We're human beings have limitations, God intervenes. As, um, who's ever been in the MRI machine? Who's been thrown in one of those horrible things? Man, I've been, in t- I've been twice in them. And once they wanted to examine my brain because my brain they thought was so good, we want to examine it. <laughs> I had something wrong. They thought there was something wrong. So they thought, oh, we've got to put you through it. And I'll never forget the Indian specialist. He was an Indian doctor. I still remember him. He, as he's looking at the, the charts, he's going, you have a pristine brain. <laughs> I'm there, great. That's what I wanted to hear. He goes, we don't know what the problem is. But the machines are terrible because they put you in this tube and it comes down like this on, on your head. And if you've got claustrophobia, it's like, whoa, this is getting really... And then they start making noise. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. I like, like, and I'm thinking, what the heck? So the next time I did it, they said, uh, I said, okay, you got a bigger machine that's not so close to my eyes? No, that's the way it is. Can I have blindfolds on? Yes, we've got those. So they give it to me. I said, and the noise is really, it's, it's just, I thought he goes, well, we can put some music on. What would you like? I said, hard rock, as loud as you can find. So I couldn't hear it. Do you know those machines? We laugh about them. But they have saved hundreds of millions of people's lives. And the man who invented it was a Christian. In his early 20s, he's studying to be a medical scientist, doctor. He's he's, he's from from Armenia, Raymond Damation. And he he became a Christian by attending a Billy Graham crusade. He put his hand up and said, Jesus, come into my life. And he's a really smart guy. And he accepts Christ as his saviour. 1957, he did as a young guy, early 20s, he's in his 80s now. And he says, and I've heard him testify this. He says, I had this idea. This idea. And I said, well, who gave you the idea? Well, because I think God gave it to him. He says, if we can x-ray people and x-ray their bones, why can't we x-ray their heart, their lungs, their brain, their eyes, their, their internal organs? So he comes up with the idea that basically, let's try and magnetize the cells. Let's magnetise them so all your cells inside go, ching, and they take a photograph. It's a bit more complicated than that. But, but anyway, they, there's people said, you're crazy, Raymond. You'll kill people. How can you magnetise their hearts? And their hearts go, up and photograph it. And he goes, oh, I, I think it's going to work. And he builds the first machine. It's in the Smithsonian. And he's really brave and courageous, so he throws his assistant in the machine first. <laughs> and it worked. It worked. And you can read the story. Check it out on on Wikipedia. I think it's true, what Wikipedia writes. (laughs) What I'm saying is this. What a great invention that is. That they they now can see everything inside of you. They can say, oh, Bill, look at that. That, that, That's your liver. That's your pancreas. That's your kidney. And this is, oh, that's going well. That's not going too well. They couldn't do that before. Before the mid-1970s. This is only like... 40 years ago and they've become better and better and his vision was I want a machine in every hospital in every nation of the world and for them to be as cheap as possible that's God Jesus gives those ideas and kids you may get an idea from him he may pop an idea in your head and it may change the world There's no limitations to what God can do through us. So all these amazing transformative inventions and and things that add value to our lives and are good things come from him. Because every good and perfect gift comes from him. It reveals his power. It displays his power and his creativity. And he shows us there's nothing impossible with, with, with him. And where there are limitations that where, where something seems impossible, we pray and we talk to him and we look to the God of the impossible to answer our prayers. He's the amazing counsellor. He is a strong God. Jesus is the loving wisdom of God. Jesus is the, is the limitless power of God. Thirdly, Isaiah says he's the eternal father. 
Jesus is the liberating image of God. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. Every religion of man has some truth in it. And I was fortunate at university back in the early 70s to do a sub-major in religious education, studies. And really interesting, studying Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism and, and Taoism, Confucianism and Zoroastrianism and all the isms. And uh, one of the books I still got at home called The Religions of Man. And as I'm going through the course over the years, I thought, you know what? There's a lot of good things in religion. There's a lot of good things in philosophy. But it's actually, what it reveals, it's human beings striving to somehow find meaning to their lives. They know there's a God. There's a God-shaped void. And they're reaching out to try and find him. The truth is this regarding Christ. Is that God sent him as a little baby 2,000 years ago. Grew up as a man. And he walked and talked and lived among us. To show us exactly what he is like. Only when he was fully human and being fully God could he identify with each of us. And so when you read the four Gospels, you see a man, the God-man. And he interacted and, and he faced all the problems that, that we face. Yet he never gave in to the independent lifestyle. He depended fully on God. He never sinned. He was tempted. Man, he was tempted like all of us. But he never actually gave in. And so we see in him, as, as we read what he says and how he acted, we see exactly what God is like. And you see, it's God reaching out to us and revealing himself exactly as he is. And the picture we see of Jesus is beautiful. You cannot help but say, wow, what a God that we have. He's not an angry old man up, in, up there somewhere. When I see God the Father, I see him as smiling. As a, as a happy dad who loves people, who's creative, who's full of colour. He's a musician, he's an artist. That's why we love the arts and music. He's creative. But he grieves over how people, what happens to people when they live independently of him. And he gave them that freedom to choose. And they chose the wrong thing. And so he says, I don't want to send them to hell. They're sending themselves to hell. And people say, is there a hell? I say, yeah, there's hell. I can demonstrate what hell is here on earth. You go to a prison, that's hell. Prisons, physical prisons, are a picture of what hell is. Separation, isolation from loved ones. Somebody else totally controlling your life from the moment you get up to the moment you go to bed. And I've talked to enough people who have been in prison and say, I never want to go back there again. It's hell, they say, I say precisely. It's a picture of eternal hell, eternal separation from God, eternal separation from those that you love, being totally under the domination of another power who's not wanting your freedom, but wanting to control you and ultimately to hurt you. And as we know, though they try and do the best they can in the prison system, sometimes prisoners come out worse than before they came in. So prisons are like a picture of what hell is like. God doesn't want any of us to be in prison. He's come to set the prisoner free. He has come to show us that God is loving and kind and beautiful. And when you look at Christ, you say, this, uh, this, this is the God I want. And so you might have some notions of what you think God is like. That will be blown out of your brain when you read the Gospels. You may have come from another religious faith and there may be some good things there that you've employed regarding morals and ethics, but it does not provide the way of salvation. The only way a person can find salvation is through Jesus Christ. So his good life as he lived a perfect life among us, that's accredited to us. We've lived disobedient lives, he's lived obedient, an obedient life. And so that's credited to us. When he dies on a cross, guys, Christmas, you can't understand Christmas without Easter. He dies on a cross so that that independence, that separation, the, the consequences, the, the, the guilt, the sin could be removed. Only he could do it. When his body was broken, when his blood was shed, at that time God the Father said, 
I can save them now because I've removed their sin. So now God can, can welcome us into his presence through what Jesus did through his life and his dead, death and his resurrection. And the thing is, he rose again, he went to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit, and he is among us today through the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is the liberating image of God. When you read and reflect on, on, on his words and you open your heart to him, something supernatural happens where you see what God is really like. And finally, he's the Prince of Peace or the Prince of Wholeness, Isaiah says. Jesus is the lasting salvation of God. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. I love this statement. He says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, by trusting Jesus, not by trying to save yourself, not by trying to live a good life, but by trusting in, in his good life, in what he did when he walked this earth, when he died on a cross, Faith means trusting and just saying, thank you, Lord, you've done it for me. We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. And this peace spreads and grows. It says in Isaiah, there will be no limits to the wholeness he brings. So when you have peace with God, spiritually, something happens to you inside. You end up becoming whole on the inside. Peace floods your soul your mind, your memory, and you become a more peaceful person. And then what takes place is that flows out where you have peace between people. There can be no, no resolution to the issue of war between nations and between people until we're at peace with God and that we have unconditionally surrendered, laid down our arms, our independence as God, you're right, I'm wrong, save me through Jesus, and then we end up having peace with him. Peace floods our soul, and we're able to develop peaceful relationships with other people. I want to pray for you, and also for all the kids. We're good to, to, to pray together. Can we stand? Let's stand together. I'm going to sing a song in a moment, but with what I'm saying here today, that beautiful passage in Isaiah, read it for yourself, Isaiah 9, it's just a wonderful passage. Read, read the Gospels for yourself, Matthew, Mark, Luke or John. That final statement of Isaiah, he says, his, Jesus' ruling authority will grow and there'll be no limits to the wholeness he brings. Will you invite Jesus to rule in your life and submit to his authority? Oh, I tell you, it seems like a paradox. You submit to his authority and you find freedom. Independence goes out the window and dependence on him causes freedom and life and peace and the gift of eternal life where we will live forever and ever and ever. And that's the quest of all religions and all philosophies. Is there an afterlife? There is. Jesus went there and he says, where I'm going, you're going to follow me at the right time. We're never going to die. We're never going to die if you put your faith in him. You will live with him forever. And he promises to return, to fix everything up that's wrong within our world. And so... Would you invite him to rule in, in your life? Will you ask him to make you whole, restore you back to the Father? And then that wholeness, that peace will flood your soul and you're able to develop really good, whole, wholesome, peaceful relationships with those around about you, which we so desperately need. Let's close our eyes and pray. Kids as well, all the kids. Right where we're standing, whether you're a young child, teenager, or an oldie, if God is speaking to you this Christmas day, I encourage you to invite Jesus now and say something like this, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I ask you to rule my life. 
Thank you, Jesus, that you're the loving wisdom of God. Thank you, Jesus, you're the limitless power of God. Thank you, Jesus, you're the liberating image of God. Thank you, Jesus, you're the lasting salvation of God. You give the gift of eternal life. So, Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I give my heart to you. I receive now your gift of forgiveness and the gift of eternal life and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord, start making me whole from the inside out as I begin this salvation journey. Thank you and amen. Let's sing this song.